Hello everyone. Welcome to the Pediatric IR webinar today. My name is Shima Tafreshi. I'm a third year here at the University of Rochester. And today I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Joseph Reese. Dr. Reese completed his medical school at SUNY Upstate Medical University. He then completed an internship year at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, followed by his radiology residency here at the University of Rochester. He then went on to finish a fellowship in IR at University of Rochester, followed by a fellowship in pediatric radiology at Boston Children's Hospital. His work includes a mix of both pediatric and adult IR, and we're very fortunate to have him talk to us about the pediatric IR's development over the past 20 years and the future trends in the field today. If you have any questions, you can put the, your questions in the questions tab, and we'll talk about them at the end of the lecture today. All right, Dr. Reese, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Shima. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about pediatric interventional radiology and putting it in the context of adult interventional radiology. And I learned a little bit in preparing for this talk about pediatric interventional radiology, so we're going to go back quite a ways in terms of visiting the history of the field itself. And then we'll come back around to the present and talk about some future directions and pathways for anyone who's interested in pediatric IR. So the outline for this talk is going to review adult interventional radiology. Then we're going to talk about a history of pediatric interventional radiology, a little more detailed by decade. And then once we get to the present day, we'll talk about a few areas that pediatric IR will be expanding into. There are obviously going to be more over time, but these are a few where I think we have potential for some growth. And then I can talk about some pathways to become a pediatric interventional radiologist, either through formal pediatric training or through adult training and then transition. So I talk about a history of adult interventional radiology. We break it down usually into vascular and non-vascular uh, techniques, and they are fairly separate in terms of who pioneered them. The Seldinger technique was really a mark for the advent of radiology and diagnostic radiology, and then interventional radiology in the sense that it allowed cannulation of a blood vessel, femoral artery. From there, we wanted to move from simply accessing the blood vessel to angioplasty and angioplasty techniques. And that's where Charles Dodder in 1963 started to pioneer that. And that's one of the reasons people sometimes refer to him as the father of interventional radiology. However, it wasn't shortly after that that his angioplasty technique was modified in 1977 with a different type of angioplasty balloon. And in the 80s, we saw the advent of balloon expandable stents, um, obviously self-expanding stents, and then stent graft technology by the 90s. Embolotherapy, believe it or not, including gel foam and PVA or polyvinyl alcohol particles have been used since the 1970s for bleeding or other necessary embolization procedures. And a lot of people talk about the Seldinger technique, so I just put a brief mention uh, about, about, it, about it here. About it here. The techniques it involves placing a needle into an artery, cannulating that artery, and starting your procedure. But actually, the original Seldinger technique involved placing a needle through and through the vessel. We call that a double puncture until you hit the femoral head, until you hit the bone. And that needle had a stylet, so you take that stylet out, and as you pull it back, you wait until you get blood return, which would be here, and then you put your wire in. So that's the actual Seldinger technique. What we use today most of the time is called a modified Seldinger technique where we enter the vessel once. So that was the original technique described to catheterize femoral vessel. And then Charles Dodder came up with the idea of angioplasty. And certainly not what you think of angioplasty today as. He basically took a series of, we can call them catheters, but they're really thick wires with dilators attached to them, and he used those dilators to slowly open a lesion. After that, the advent of 
balloon technology started to appear. And you can see on the left here, one of the early balloon models. It's certainly not what we have today. Today we have a dual woman balloon where you inflate, uh, at least some of the models where you inflate the balloon, but you can also put a wire through the center of the catheter itself. So the advent of balloon plasty and bolotherapy and accessing blood vessels were kind of a trio of events that, that sparked the onset of more developments in adult interventional radiology vascular-wise. Non-vascular adult interventional radiology also had a lot of advents and developments in as far back as the 1950s all the way up to the 1980s. And they included access for nephrostomy tubes or studies of the urinary tract, as well as cholangiography and uh, gastrostomy tube placement. So that's a brief history of adult interventional radiology. Now I'm going to put things in context of pediatric interventional radiology. We're going to take kind of a VH1 look at each decade. And believe it or not, most of what we do today in pediatric interventional radiology uh, originated almost 30 to 35 years ago at least, and was done not too differently from how we do it now. If you look at pediatric radiology in the 1980s, a lot of what was reported in terms of procedures throughout the 1980s developed in the late 1970s, and they involved biopsies, genital urinary access, like I just talked about in adults, cholangiography, fluid aspiration, and uh, balloon dilation of strictures. A lot of things that are in the non-vascular interventional radiology world. However, I think people often have the misconception that vascular interventional radiology was not being used in children at this time. And it, it really couldn't be further from the truth. So basically, most of what you think of as interventional radiology in kids today was being used in the 1980s or pioneered then. If we look at genital urinary access, you can see that for that and abscess drains, ultrasound and fluoroscopy was being used for both. And that started in 1977 and went on into the mid 80s. And on the top images, you can see a fungus ball in the renal collecting system and a catheter being used to help drain that. Over on the bottom image, you see what some of the older ultrasound machines look like, or images, I should say. The images were pretty rudimentary at that time, especially in the between the early to mid 1980s. And so you also had to rely on CAT scans to tell you whether or not you could drain an abscess in this case or whether there was any bowel lying in front of it. So these techniques were being pioneered, but of course the imaging still had to catch up a little bit at that time. The interesting thing is that for embolization, angioplasty, fibrinolysis in kids, it started around the same time. Trauma embolization in children with pelvic fractures was reported in the late 1970s. Bronchial artery embolization for cystic fibrosis was reported around the same time. And then in the early to mid 1980s, we saw some pretty advanced reports of uh, fibrinolysis and angioplasty and embolization. And so we see this is mostly embolization listed here, but transcatheter embolization of AVMs and splenic artery embolization for reduction in children with polysplenism. Uh, when you look at this particular picture as an example of a GI bleed that was performed in a patient, you can see it as the blush at the bottom of the film. And this is an AVM embolization. Now, arterial venous malformations, it took a long time to understand, and we're still understanding them. And there are a lot of people who have spent a lot of time trying to understand them, and we all have different ways of embolizing them, whether it's with particles in some cases, coils on the venous end, or glue, uh, glue or another liquid embolic such as onyx. However, at this time, earlier in the 1980s, basically a combination of PVA particles and coils were used to occlude these AVMs. And often symptoms in terms of throbbing or steel were part of the issue, but the other part was surgical correction in some of these cases. In this case, this child 
had a hip deformity, needed surgery for the hip deformity, and so had to undergo AVM embolization. The arterial venous malformation was embolized, and they did proceed to surgery. However, they lost a lot of blood, uh, if I recall in this case, over 20 units. Nevertheless, if they hadn't had the AVM embolized, they probably wouldn't have made it through the surgery. When we look at newborn angiography, even in 1977, this is a child born probably with uh, some trauma, per se, to the right shoulder, and you can see a filling defect as we follow the axillary artery out on the right side. And surgeons used this angiogram at that time to explore that vessel and Fogarty sweep the clot out of the vessel. So a lot of interesting techniques. This is an example of thrombolysis, thrombosis of the aorta, I believe in a child, uh, I think with vasculitis, but urokinase was infused for 11 days in this child. It's a long time. However, you do see perfect opening of the aorta. So a lot of these techniques developed in the 80s. And in terms of plasty, coronary balloons were being used around that time too. This is an example of renal artery stenosis being balloon angioplasty with very good result. And in this case, a good clinical result as well, not just technical. Enteric and hepatobiliary interventions, nonvascular interventions in the um, GI tract and liver were also making strides in the 1980s. Balloon dilation of enteric strictures and gastrostomy tube placement, anterograde and retrograde were making strides as well as angiography for hepatic transplants large studies on biloma drainages and liver transplants and plasty of biliary strictures. At this time, transplant interventions were a little different than we think of today in children, mainly because children weren't getting uh, split livers. They weren't getting as many really partial transplants. It was uh, a larger transplanted organ at that time. So a deceased donor transplant in an adult would be the equivalent of that. A lot of hepaticojejunostomies of a whole liver with stricture at the distal end. And you can see here, here's an example of a percutaneous cholangiogram stricture, balloon plasty, good result. Gastrostomy placement, uh, antegrade and retrograde techniques were developed. There are camps who put both in today. A lot of people favor antegrade techniques because of a lower complication rate. Essentially, you access on the left in a retrograde fashion, but you snare the wire from the mouth and you pull it up to the mouth. Basically, you pull the wire from the stomach back up to the mouth and you can pull the gastrostomy tube through. Foreign body retrieval. I don't think we do as much of this today, but uh, radiographically, certain catheters were developed for removing foreign bodies. One of the interesting ones is here. This is a magnet catheter. It's actually a very strong magnet attached to a catheter, and it's used to remove foreign bodies that have magnetic properties. In this case, a steel ball that the child swallowed or tried to swallow. One of the other interesting drainages that was done in the 1980s that we still see today on and off, but was more reported then was pancreatic pseudocyst drains. And I don't really know if it's because conservative treatment is better or I just don't see them a lot, but I haven't seen one, maybe I've seen one <laughs> in, in my training and practice, uh, but it was not infrequent uh, at the time. So then we move on to the 1990s. And the 1980s really spurned the development of a lot of the techniques we're using now 1990s built on those a little bit. Uh, there were larger studies regarding enteral access. And we talk about upper and lower GI access. So cecostomy tubes, lower GI access, we started to get a feel for that. Uh, central venous access started to become a territory for us with publications demonstrating an equivalent infection rate and complication rate to surgical placement of tunneled central lines and reports of safe interventional radiology placement of metaports in children. And then we had the, the development really of ablation technology in the 1990s. And that's important. It's important 
because most of the techniques we used in the 1980s were mechanical. We basically put particles in a blood vessel to block it, or we used a balloon to open a blood vessel. But when you think about ablation, you realize that we are now directing treatment to an organ based on different energy levels. It's a different type of treatment, really. And vascular malformations are important because they, they mark a type of treatment for drug delivery to a particular area. I'm going to talk more, a little bit more about vascular malformations in the 2000s when we really get to see more imaging of them and procedures before them, but delivering doxycycline or sodium tetradecal sulfate to different types of malformations to treat them is a drug delivery method, just like we talk about transarterial chemoembolization today. So there were some big strides made at that time. And you see the pictures here. This is actually of a microwave probe, which wasn't around back then. They were radio frequency probes, but they're both types of thermal ablation. And then that's the cecostomy tube that I placed, but it's using almost the same technique that was used in 1996 when it was reported. Transplant interventions also increased in the 1990s as we started doing low volume uh, single lobe transplants, like a left liver transplant, okay? And uh, as we did more transplants in children, you'd see over time mismatches in let's say the portal vein, or you might see um, just portal venous stenosis de novo. And so those interventions started to increase, the splenal portal imaging and interventions. Intestinal transplants started being pioneered and they came with their own series of strictures and need for imaging and intervention. Lung and heart transplants increased. Uh, I think we had some role in cardiac intervention. However, the interventional cardiologists, pediatric interventional cardiologists have a pretty strong hold on that territory right now. And I think they uh, were involved with a lot of the treatments related to that from the 1990s to 2000s and onward. For lung transplants, our main involvement would be in tracheal and bronchial stenosis, where we could plasty or put potentially a retrievable stent by the 2000s, and we could perform biopsies with better imaging. Hepatic artery interventions, especially in transplants, became more important as the number of transplants went up and transjugular liver biopsies as are shown here. This is an example in a child who has a transplant, and if we look at the hepatic artery, uh, the transplanted artery does have a stenosis in it. There's a little defect adjacent to it. I don't know if it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it was angioplasty to better result, and the transplant took and did pretty well. This is an example of a TIPS, so pediatric TIPS became doable, and uh, I wouldn't say frequent, but it wasn't infrequent during that time period. And so this is an example of that. Uh, and here we we see a good example of what I'm talking about with a limited left hepatic transplant. So this is just the left lobe of the liver, and it's stenosed. And if you're going to perform a cholangiogram, you want to take a sub-xiphoid approach. This isn't the standard cholangiogram where you start from the intercostal area at the right flank. You're, you're not going to hit much if you try that. So this is just the left lobe. And that's where these transplants started to, to become more popular. And they gave us more business because when you're transplanting part of a liver, that means that you have another part of a liver that can be transplanted in the future. In other words, more people can be transplanted, more people can be donors, you have a higher number of transplants. This is the kind of imaging we saw. Now, you remember that. CAT scan I showed you from the early to mid-1980s, uh, this CAT scan is much crisper. And I admit, this article was written in 2002. This is really from the late 1990s, but the CAT scan imaging took leaps and bounds ahead. And so biopsies of areas, whether it's post-transplant or whether it's not, uh, were greatly improved with the aid of improvements in resolution of CT imaging. This is an example of cecostomy tube placement. Like I said, this is me placing a cecostomy tube, very similar to the original described technique. Uh, 
you mark on the right hand side you mark the area you're going to go into with a needle or with a marker and once you're over that site you can ultrasound to make sure there's nothing in the way you insert the needle and the wire and then after you dilate over the wire and put uh, gastropexy sutures which you may see on the left image very faintly um, you can place your tube and I put in a pigtail for a few months and then put in a chait tube or a mickey button depending on what people prefer colonic motility studies were also uh, becoming popular with the advent of intestinal transplants and um, better understanding of colonic dysmotility disorders, placement of these became much more popular. This is an example of ablation. Now this is me ablating something, but it really isn't any different technique. Osteodosteoma ablation involves cannulating the nidus of a bone, whether it's the tibia or femoral bone, or a non-long bone, and you see on the right image, astidosteoma, it's cannulated. I cannulated a little bit through and through. You can see a part of the track near the end, um, and then I microwave ablated that. Sometimes you have to go a little deeper, depending on the type of microwave system or ablation system you use, whether you're treating at the tip of the probe or treating just beyond it. Uh, this e uh, individual had great results. So this is an example of what we're using today. Osteodosteomas had been biopsy before that since the late 1980s, I think 1988, but um, ablation and ablation use in kids started around this time and it was really kind of a start to the use of interventional oncology techniques for children. So then we come to the 2000s and I told you I'm going to talk about vascular malformations in a few minutes, so we'll cover that here. So the 2000s and beyond, what are we looking at in pediatric interventional radiology? Well, a lot of things have already been pioneered, so you have to ask yourself, where do we go from here now? Uh, expansion of the workforce. You're going to see that the number of pediatric interventionalists around 2000 to 2005 is small in comparison to what we have now. We, we kind of dwarf that. Attention to radiation dose. We learned how to do things and we realized that we could do them. Now we had to pay more attention to how we do them and when we should do them and uh, risks to children. Refinement of techniques. I can show you a couple cases where I have refined my techniques and I think it's an example of discovering a case and then realizing slightly better ways to do it. Increased utilization of ablation and interventional oncology. This is where we really start to see, uh, especially kind of in the 2010 and beyond period, but even in the mid 2000s, uh, percutaneous transarterial catheter delivered uh, drugs, bolotherapy to tumors. And that's an important stride for interventional radiology because it's certainly been very prolific on the adult side. And then vascular malformations, really a uh, staple of pediatric interventional radiology, uh, comes full circle. We we start to, we have MRI imaging that's really fully developed uh, to image these. We can treat all of them uh, or treat them to, to the best way possible. And some of this had started in the 1990s, but really the 2000s, we get a better handle on it. Now, this is an example, I apologize if it's a little fuzzy, of the pediatric work, workforce increase since uh, 2005, okay, to 2015. So there were 38 centers that practiced pediatric interventional radiology, okay? And in 2015, there were 88 centers. Now doesn't seem like a ton, but if you look at the actual growth of pediatric interventionalists over that time period, it's been over 315%. So it's just exploded. And part of that has been from the interest in the field and the acceptance from multiple institutions of pediatric IR and the realization that they just need it. I know here at Rochester, I was lucky. Uh, the surgeons were very open to me practicing pediatric IR for vascular access, some enteral access, and whatever else I could help with. 
but I, I know that they had probably gotten word from other parts of the country that this is being used. And as it spreads, more and more places realize the utility of pediatric IR. If you look at what people are doing with it, what they're practicing, uh, you're going to find that still a lot of pediatric IR is, sorry, a lot of pediatric IR is vascular access, okay? Then, uh, of course, biopsies and drainages and enteric access. And you have to realize that with the growth of pediatric IR, uh, more people practicing, uh, we, have, we do maintain procedure volumes, but not every procedure is going to be a really interesting angiogram. Just like on the adult side, you're going to have a mix of uh, common procedures and less common procedures. And as much as the earlier procedures were pioneered, we did renal artery stenosis, angioplasty, etc. They weren't really common. And that's where the adult side has grown so much. They just have access to more patients with these disorders. So one of our jobs is to make known that we can do these disorders, we can treat them, we have all kinds of interventional methods, and we're available to do it, but uh, you have to realize you may get called, depending on your center, once a month or once a year to do something really uh, unique and just be ready for that because um, those are the opportunities when you can really help those kids. Radiation dose. So I was telling you about how we're focusing on that. These are two articles of many that have started to uh, take the image gently, step lightly approach to radiation in the pediatric setting. We used to do a lot of procedures, and I still do some. I'm guilty of that, uh, using CT guidance. Whereas nowadays, there are many people who are using um, a modified CT slash fluoroscopic unit to decrease radiation dose. Uh, my fluoroscopy unit that we use at the University of Rochester has a significantly lower dose algorithm than the adult side does. And we keep our imaging always to three frames or less, usually less than three frames uh, per second for imaging even digital subtraction angiograms. Uh, to minimize dose. And that, that usually keeps your dose in the pediatric cases to one-tenth or less of the adult dose. And it should really be less. So one of the other advantages if you're interested in becoming a pediatric interventionalist, you're not going to have problems with radiation exposure. I can tell you that. If you're wearing your lead, for the most part, you will be doing a lot of procedures, but the radiation dose that you're getting due to um, scatter and attenuation is going to be significantly less than on the adult side. And this is an example of how I perform a gastrostomy tube, uh, just differences for different people. Uh, I know that both the anterograde and retrograde techniques were spelled out. I use a retrograde technique and I balloon dilate the tract and I put this circular balloon gastrostomy tube in and I can also use an ultrasound um, to visualize the liver, the stomach, the colon. This has been done for a long time, but we can see it really with clarity. We can see where the stomach and colon interface is. And if there is colon in the way, one of the things we can do now is we can displace it with needles. Um, we can certainly inflate the stomach uh, to displace it from the liver using a number of transhepatic methods that were really reported in the 1990s, but now we have all those methods at our hands and there really isn't a type of gastrostomy tube that I can't place. Whether I should place it or not, that's a wholly different story, but certainly getting access is not a problem anymore. The tools we have allow for more precision. They make specialized 24 gauge gault needles and people have used similar needles for a long time. These are a little bit sharper, they're very nice, and we have small peel away sheaths and small type wires that would be used in neuro interventions for our procedures. So we can really treat children with the right tools now. One of the examples of a line that's become popular in the pediatric setting from the mid-2000s to now is a tunneled femoral pick line because it can be placed at the bedside. 
by interventionalists and the tip location can be documented under ultrasound and they can stay in for one two months and for kids a lot of kids who have cardiac disorders they have a lot of interesting physiology but also anatomy occurring above the diaphragm and uh, a lot of the surgeons would rather we stay away from that so this is an easy way to access those patients and not potentially thrombose or disturb any sort of surgical correction that's been made to the cardiovascular structures. And now that we've gotten good at accessing, we can refine it a little bit. This is a child who had lymphoma and they have compression of their internal jugular veins. Uh, with slight, there is some patency of the medial aspects of the axillary joining subclavian veins and arteries. And you can see in this child, it may be hard to place an internal jugular catheter or metaport, but once you get central with the catheter, the superior vena cava is open. So this is an example of a pediatric type metaport. It's a five French Dignity Mini, which is nice. It reduces thrombosis rates when it's that small, and you can ultrasound it and see what it looks like under the skin. And I was able to find an area in the subclavian vein. It was still deep to one of the abnormal lymph nodes uh, under the clavicle where I could access, and I accessed around it. And you can see the ultrasound images and then the adjacent image, the catheter tubing going over that abnormal lymph node into the uh, subclavian vein. So with, with proper imaging now that we have, we can really refine our techniques we can avoid things, in this case, like abnormal lymph nodes. We can avoid structures that are in our path, such as the colon for gastrostomy tubes. And there really aren't procedures we can't do. This is a vascular procedure uh, that I performed. This, this was a child who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome and had a unifocalization procedure. And because for a lot of reasons, but most simply, these children have increased pulmonary artery resistance. To keep themselves oxygenated, they get a lot of collateral blood flow. And when they form collaterals, the collaterals sometimes hypertrophy and can bleed. And there are also reasons for that. So I performed a bronchial artery embolization, and I also embolized part of the internal mammary uh, artery on the left side, which is where their bleeding was coming from by bronchoscopy. However, you can see there's my arrow is pointing to a tiny branch, branch point off of the um, left subclavian artery. And this may have been pretty difficult to access uh, 20, 30 years ago. However, you can see in the left image, I'm fortunate enough to have what we call a small microcatheter or a microcatheter that's used in neurointerventions. And so I can put that over the parent catheter, kind of makes a loop. I can opacify that vessel and embolize it. And this child had had three embolization procedures before this, uh, one of which I did perform and had still had refractory bleeding a month uh, later. The bleeding stopped and then recurred. And after this, he didn't have any more bleeding and he was able to uh, transition from one surgical correction stage to the next. And he hasn't had any bleeding since. So they really do allow us to hone in our techniques. Vascular malformations are a whole nother talk, but simply arteriovenous malformations or fast flow malformations have been embolized, as I had said before, since the early 1980s. With more imaging, we could diagnose different types of malformations, and I break them up into venous, lymphatic, uh, lymphatic channel, and AVM type. However, there's so many more now, and we have such a great imaging uh, diagnostic capability as well as a clinical diagnostic capability working with the plastic surgeons and vascular malformation teams uh, of dermatologists as well and geneticists and hematologists that uh, we can really make diagnoses for a wide variety of malformations and we can treat them. I have a great MRI image of the left cheek in this child and fat suppressed uh, fluid sensitive image demonstrating a venous malformation. 
with a small uh, clot in it, and I can treat that percutaneously. Just to the left of that, we have a lymphatic malformation, macrocystic, with some fluid fluid levels. Again, I can treat that percutaneously, as you see. So it makes my job very easy in planning with the imaging, and we can deliver uh, sclerosins, whether it's doxycycline, the lymphatic, or STS to the venous malformation. Another big stride, and one of the reasons this has come full circle, is the pioneering of lymph angiography. Accessing lymph nodes, it's a groin lymph node that's being accessed in the right image, and actually the needle's going a little too far. I needed to retract it into the medulla of that lymph node. But we access those in children who have chylus leaks, whether it's chylus ascites or whether it's a chylus pleural effusion uh, for a variety of reasons, often cardiac patients, uh, and need embolization potentially, or at least diagnosis of where the leak is. And as you can see on the adjacent image, that's a conventional lapiodol lymphangiogram uh, that I performed in one child with concern for lymphatic leak. The child had outflow tract obstruction because their left IJ and subclavian veins were occluded uh, from prior catheterizations a couple months before, well, one month before. This was, I think, uh, two or three months old. Now you can see adjacent to that that there have been techniques, MR lymphangiography, that have developed where we don't need to use lapiodol. Uh, we can do a shorter, sometimes shorter, imaging run where we can see exactly what type of abnormality is going on, where the leak is, define our anatomy, and then plan accordingly to treat it. And finally, you can see on the last image an example of me noting where the lymphatic duct was, cannulating it from the anterior belly, seeing a small needle all the way from the anterior belly to the spine, pulling back until I cannulate that lymphatic duct with a wire. And once we're in the right portion of it, we can embolize with a small amount of glue or coils or other embolics, depending on what people desire. Interventional oncology, I was talking about quite a bit, transarterial chemotherapy, similar idea to adults, the liver delivery, um, transcatheter, intra-arterial of chemotherapeutic agents in an embolic fashion. There are some indications for this in children. Pediatric pedocellular carcinoma, fibrolamellar subtype, palliation, uh, sometimes in certain metastases. Please excuse the spelling. And unresectable hepatoblastoma. Now, unresectable hepatoblastoma is a big one because sometimes a significant portion of hepatoblastomas cannot be resected and they need some sort of downstaging mechanism. Chemotherapy helps, but children can't always tolerate it. The caveat is that if they are downstaged, if the two, or if the tumor becomes resectable, the cure rate can go up significantly. So that's where we can play a role as pediatric interventional radiologists. And there have been a number of studies on this. None of them are huge, uh, but they, there have been a number, mostly uh, in the East in Asia, with fairly good results. Uh, some are mixed. The problem is that hepatoblastoma is a rare tumor. And so what's really needed at this point, and a number of authors have pointed it out, is a multi-center trial for embolization of these tumors so that they can show the best technique and that that technique works. So if you get called for one, let's say once a year or once every other year and you're a practicing pediatric interventionist, you can offer that and you have data to support you. This is an example of a taste. This is an infant and there's a very large hepatoblastoma dominating most of the right hepatic lobe, probably part of the left hepatic lobe as well, most of the liver really. And you can see what embolization looks like after lapiodol chemotherapy introduction. Now, the other reason this has to be investigated more
different people will use different concentrations and some of the chemotherapy that's used in Asia is a little different from the United States. It's not that different, but there will be technical differences that have to be sorted out. So now what about the future of pediatric interventional radiology? Well, one thing I haven't talked about a lot in the 2000s is more transplant interventions, but there have been a plethora of them. There have been a plethora of TIPS, revision of mesorex shunts or surgical shunts, transplantic interventions, okay, and refinement of those, refinement of individual TIP shunts, uh, narrowing them and then slowly expanding them over time. The introduction of you know, initially non-covered stents and now covered stents in children, similar to adults, accessing uh, the portal system in a transplantic fashion for a variety of interventions, including TIPS, have all become more refined. None of this is new, but it's becoming more refined. And the revision of surgical shunts is becoming more popular, and I think it, it has been done before, but you're just going to see an increase in the increase in the results. Interventional oncology, again, multi-center trial, I think will come in the future, and that's going to support our role in the cases, whether they're rare or common at your institution, uh, of treatment for that. Additionally, ablation, which I really haven't talked about more since the 2000s, cryoablation, for both palliation and treatment of tumors, uh, but radiofrequency ablation and microwave ablation can be applied to all kinds of tumors. I have a case of microwave ablation of an adrenal uh, cortical carcinoma metastasis in a five-year-old, and they're doing great. So the one area I didn't talk about before was renal interventions. I think dialysis-related interventions in children and the need for appropriately sized dialysis catheters is going to increase in the future, and there are a lot of people working on that. Uh, this is an example of when we talk about specialty catheters, dialysis catheters are often 8 French in size, or 10 French, which is very large for, for a neonate. And we have some ways around that with catheters, but none of them are formalized. Uh, they're jerry-rigged a little bit, and they're not perfect in how they work. Part of that is also because the dialysis equipment we have is not perfect for children either. It really needs to be better tailored, and people are working on that. This is an example of a dialysis catheter sitting in a child, and it's very low on the right side, and one of the reasons is because it's a tapered tip, and so when we retract the distal portion of the catheter, the proximal portion, which is sitting almost outside the right atrium, uh, becomes occluded, and so it, it becomes a big headache in how to appropriately place these catheters for kids. Dialysis interventions in kids in terms of fistula interventions may increase. We'll see over time. There, there has been talk, uh, although I haven't seen it really increase right now, in microfistulas in kids, and maybe with increased technology in dialysis machines, we'll be able to use more like this radiocephalic fistula in children. Now, I've told you a little bit about pediatric interventional radiology and where we are and where we're going. If you want to be a part of it, there's certainly a lot of pathways. Um, the three components, potential components of the pathway, an adult interventional radiology fellowship, pediatric interventional radiology fellowship, and a pediatric radiology, diagnostic radiology fellowship. The pathway I took was the one at the top, which why I listed it. <laughs> uh, adult IR, pediatric IR fellowship, and then attending. However, uh, some people take a full pediatric route, pediatric radiology fellowship, pediatric IR, and a PIR attending. And you can do all three of them. There are people that elect to do that. Some people skip the pediatric IR fellowship just from an adult IR fellowship you will have a lot of the skills especially with the technology and today's equipment to be able to do these procedures. They all have their advantages and disadvantages and I'm sure you could probably do just the pediatric IR fellowship alone uh, if you wanted. These are pathways I note at least here in the United States I don't know if there are different pathways elsewhere. Um, the advantage of having pediatric IR as a fellowship in addition to adult is that you, you get an idea of the feel of working, technical feel of working uh, on smaller children. 
performing procedures, but you also understand the nature of pediatric IR. It really is different from adult. Uh, treating children is different in terms of parent-child interactions and our interactions with them, but the diseases they have are very different. The advantage of a pediatric radiology fellowship is that you can often do pediatric interventional radiology, practice that at a job, but you can also read pediatric radiology. So you can be a pediatric radiologist in academic centers. In private practice, if you want to uh, be a pediatric radiologist, you may not need a specific credential. However, it helps. So if you really want to read imaging as well as practice pediatric IR, that's an advantage. Um, all three offer you a lot of advantages. The one advantage of having the Adult IR Fellowship is you really get uh, practice with a lot of IR techniques, and I think that you can be exposed to them in, in, in pediatric IR fellowships, but I, I'm not convinced that you're exposed to the full gamut of interventional procedures uh, and skill set uh, that accompanies those as opposed to having an adult IR fellowship. I think I think that really gives you a lot. Um, so these are some of my references, uh, not in any particular order in this case. And that's why we do it. It's for the kids. This is my daughter uh, playing Singing in the Rain, I guess. But thanks. Thanks for your time and for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Reese, for this very informative talk and giving us and more giving insight us into more the world of pediatric, of pediatric IR. IR. So I just had a question, had a for, question you. for you. I was wondering, I was as, wondering you as you were going through your training, your what training. made you interested, made you interested in, the in the world of pediatric IR, pediatric IR as opposed to adult IR? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, I think everyone's training is going to be a little unique. I originally wanted to be a vascular surgeon. That's why I went into adult interventional radiology. Um, a lot of that was because I was interested in vascular fluid flow from my days as a chemical engineer. However, uh, my wife uh, was in training at the same time as me, and she got a fellowship at uh, Massachusetts General on transplant infectious disease. And I was looking for a job at the time. I had just graduated as an adult interventional radiologist, and there really wasn't a good IR job in the Massachusetts area that I saw. And I looked around and around, and then I saw this pediatric IR fellowship. And I didn't know anything about it at the time. I mean, I know what pediatric interventions are vaguely, but I, I didn't know the details. And I went and interviewed with uh, Ahmed Alamari and uh, everyone else that was great, you know, um, Dr. Padwell and... Uh, you know, Dr. Chaudhary and um, it was just great. It took off from there. And, and I really started to realize that I had no comfort and really no knowledge of pediatric IR and that it was going to take more than just me saying I could do it. Um, I had to get some sort of training and some sort of exposure. And, you know, one thing I would say, if you want to do it, take a look at a lot of programs because each one's different. At Boston, I did a uh, Good amount of transplant work, but a lot of vascular malformations, tons. However, I can tell you, you know, fresh um, G2 placement, fresh secostomy tube placement, it was less common there. When I came into my practice at Rochester, that's a lot of what I do. Whereas if you go to another center, they may be strong in another aspect of pediatric interventional radiology. So, um, Every place has its strengths and weaknesses, and depending on how you think you want to tell you your practice or what you want to do, you should look at a number of them. All right. Thank you for your answer. And then we have one more question. Um, you gave us a little bit about, about how to pursue a pediatric IR career. Do you have any other advice for trainees who are interested in pursuing pediatric IR? Um, I think that uh, one of the things you can do, depending on where you are, is if there is a pediatric IR section there, obviously you can go talk to them. And some of the major centers will certainly have that. Um, you can also go um, to pediatric radiologists in your hospital and talk to them. Because I guarantee they've done some pediatric 
interventional radiology, but they can also get you in touch with people who they know. And most of us in pediatric interventional radiology are more than happy to talk to everybody uh, about it. And the last thing I would say is we have an annual meeting, SPIR, the Society for Pediatric Interventional Radiology. And it is similar to adult in that we have people from around the world, but um, we really mix the location all over the world. Some years it's in London, some year, the next year it's in Hawaii, it was in Denver, uh, Australia one year. So, you know, if you're looking for a fun place to get away for a little bit, it's, it's a nice place to see what we're all about. All right, thank you. And then we have some more questions from the audience. The first one is, what is the sclerosant of choice for klippel trenanoi syndrome? It, it kind of depends on what you're treating. So um, klippel trenanoi syndrome is a syndrome that has a host of issues. And uh, one of the issues in klippel trenanoi syndrome is that you can have overgrowth and um, venous malformations or lymphatic abnormalities. So for venous malformations, I treat with sodium tetradecyl sulfate. Okay, that's in the United States. If you go to different countries, they may use other sclerosants. So I use 3% sodium, sodium tetradecyl sulfate. Uh, if you're looking to treat a long vein, they're embryologic abnormal veins that occur in the lower extremities, some people will perform um, Lobectomies of those, or they'll use uh, lasers to treat them. So they will photocoagulate them, per se, with lasers. Okay, thank you. And the next question is What challenges have you encountered regarding the hardware, given most of it is made for the adult population? Yeah, so um, I think one of the best things you can do there every about 10 years pediatric interventionalists and techniques in interventional radiology or a similar journal will release uh, an article. They'll, they'll write an article where they talk about how they do interventional procedures. And they talk about using certain types of needles, 24 gauge, this gauge, that gauge. Some of the needles are actually IV needles that nursing use. However, some of the catheters, you're going to have to reach out to vendors. Uh, Medical Components is a vendor who who utilizes a lot of pediatric equipment or makes a lot of pediatric equipment. Uh, sometimes, for example, my gastrostomy tubes I use are from Cook, but I also talk to Hallard Health. A lot of it's going to be Googling on the internet where you can get a 12 French gastrostomy tube and then calling vendors and talking to them. And that's how I learned about most of the equipment that I have. In fact, unfortunately, even on the adult side, you will see this equipment as residents and fellows, and then you'll become an attending. And you'll say, what was that catheter we used? You know, we didn't know it either five years ago, but we talked to we talked to the people in industry a lot. And the best places for that, uh, you can learn it in the training, but also at the SIR uh, annual meeting. There are all kinds of wonders there, and they can show you a lot of cool stuff. All right, thank you for your advice. And one more question from our audience. Um, they're saying that most centers for fellowship training may not have PEDS exposure. So what is the best way to deal with that situation? Um, if you're talking about, so if we're talking about fellowship training in terms of adult fellowship training, um, one thing you can do, um, I know on the, I think on the adult website, or I can send something out, there is a listing of pediatric training programs. And I don't know if any of them have limited training opportunities for a few months uh, in interventional radiology. I know we were talking with one of our residents, I think, who may be able to do a split adult and pediatric IR training at Columbia. Uh, some centers do offer that, and you can look into those. But for ones that don't, you could certainly reach out to other places and ask them if they have an opening for a limited slot. Um, you know, aside from that, if you're going into private practice, I would partner with someone who um, who has done some of the pediatrics and go from there. But you feel free to reach out to me, myself, or anyone else that you know in pediatric law and we'd be happy to help you with training opportunities. 
Okay, thank you so much. And then the last question is, do you have any advice about getting involved with research opportunities in pediatric IR? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of research opportunities, one of the things that you can do, um, and that I do, I can send a, a link to you there. We have a pediatric interventional radiology forum, and um, most of it's for adult uh, attending interventional radiologists, but also pediatric interventional radiologists, and I know that there's a lot of discussion about different things on that forum. Um, I can forward that. But the, the other thing uh, I can always forward to you, again, is probably people at some of the major centers, and including myself. And if you email us and you have sort of a passion to get involved in research, we can help you out. Um, unfortunately, it's not simply coming up with an idea. You're going to need a larger patient volume, and so you have to get in touch with that kind of population. All right. Thank you so much for the talk. I hope everyone else enjoyed the session as much as I did. Um, thank you. Thank you so much.